Good morning, everyone, and welcome to or welcome back to CDC. It's great to have you here. We're very much looking forward to celebrating uh, a 70th, seven decades of firsts at CDC. Welcome to everyone who's here in person as well as watching uh, on live video. We have a lot to cover in a short time period, uh, and we're really delighted to have past directors with us to celebrate, to reflect on the past, and look forward to the future. There is so much to be proud of as we think of what CDC has accomplished in the past, and also so much to be excited about, about what more we can accomplish in the future. Uh, there is much to do to help Americans live longer, healthier, more productive lives, and we're delighted to kick off this conversation a very special Public Health Grand Rounds. We're going to start with three videos. Uh, we're going in order of service of past CDC directors. So we'll first be hearing uh, from three directors who couldn't join us. By chance, they're the three who go chronologically first. Uh, Bill Fagey, Jim Mason, and Bill Roper. And we'll hear about some of the great uh, accomplishments and thoughts from each of their terms at CDC. Bill Fagey served from 77 to 83. Of course, uh, this was a, a momentous period uh, in which uh, smallpox eradication was announced. Uh, the first AIDS cases were uh, reported in the MMWR. Uh, ATSDR was established. We'll then hear from Jim Mason, uh, and uh, there uh, from 83 to 89, a period when the Office of Smoking and Health joined CDC, and the Polio Eradication Initiative was launched. Following that, we'll hear from Bill Roper, uh, 90 to 93, uh, the first youth risk behavior survey, national strategy for early detection uh, and control of breast and cervical cancer, uh, other key initiatives. Uh, after that, I'll come back to introduce uh, David Satcher, uh, who uh, we'll hear more about and from in a minute. But we'll now go right to three videos uh, in uh, succession. I actually started at CDC 54 years ago when CDC was only 16 years old. I became the director 39 years ago, and there were two immediate challenges. One was morale was very low. The nation had just gone through the swine flu uh, problem, and with swine flu, the former director, David Sensor, had concluded quite correctly that this was a new virus, it was now spreading in humans at Fort Dix, and we had no immunity. In the past, every time those three things came together, there was a pandemic, he decided quite correctly to have an immunization program against swine flu, but the epidemic never occurred and some people had adverse reactions. So while it was a bright public health decision, the political parties and the news media made a big thing out of CDC having made a mistake. When Joseph Califano became secretary of what was then HEW, he decided to fire Dave Sensor because of that and morale at CDC was very low. A petition was written, sent to the secretary, which I signed, asking him to reconsider, which he did not. So that was the big challenge of morale. The second challenge was, while CDC had started as an infectious disease agency, there were new things coming into public health, environmental health, occupational health, chronic diseases, and we had to look at what should the objectives be for this institution. We did three things. We sent letters to hundreds and hundreds of people asking, what do you think the priorities of CDC should be? Dr. Seth uh, Liebler then put together all of the answers into a coherent picture. And we asked an outside group that became known as the Red Book Committee because of their report being read, what they thought we should do. And they looked at the suggestions, past history, and they came up with 12 uh, priority objectives for CDC. Third and last thing, we took the top management staff at CDC on two retreats to Berry College and we worked out what CDC should be doing and how we should be organized. There were a number of accomplishments that offset this poor morale. Number one, smallpox was eradicated in the world and CDC was a major part of that. Number two, the vaccine 
program and CDC became just first class. President Carter and Secretary Califano were totally supportive, made sure we had the resources, and we were able to bring immunization rates up to 90, 92, 95 percent. And then we did something that was just unbelievable. We asked whether we could break measles transmission in the United States, and we did. This led to international implications because in 1984, Jonas Salk and Robert McNamara helped to lead an effort to ask the question, how could we apply what was learned in the United States to the world as a whole? And there was a task force formed in March of 1984 called the Task Force for Child Survival. It included WHO, UNICEF, UNDP, the World Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation, and in six short years, immunization levels in the world were brought from 20% up to 80%. So that on September 30th, 1990, at the World Summit for Children, Jim Grant was able to get up and say, 80% of children in the world have received at least one vaccine. He called it the biggest peacetime effort that the world has ever seen. Another great accomplishment, 1978, the Public Health Service started an effort to develop objectives in health for the year 1990. First meeting was held at Emory and at CDC, and 220 objectives were set for 1990. By 1990, 50% of those objectives had been met. But what was very important, it started a process. So every decade, these objectives are updated, and it doesn't matter which political party is in power. But this also had international ramifications because Rafe Henderson, a CDC employee working at WHO in 1988, March of 1988, presented the first objectives for global health in children. And this eventually led to the Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development Goals. There are other accomplishments that it should be mentioned two for sure. Rise syndrome. Two former EIS officers, Karen Starko and George Johnson, worked out the problem of what was causing Rise syndrome and found that it was basically due to the use of aspirin in children who had chickenpox or flu. And by advertising this, even though the White House at that time did not want this information out because the aspirin manufacturers were putting pressure on them. Just by putting this information out, Rye syndrome has decreased uh, tremendously in this country and now around the world. The other program I have to mention is AIDS. This developed in the 19, early 1980s, and one of the unsung heroes was Paul Wiesner, who was head of STDs at that time. He immediately put a half dozen investigators on this problem to try to figure it out. Then Jim Curran and Harold Jaffe ran the AIDS program for years, and CDC did a very excellent job at finally figuring out what was happening with AIDS and how it could be prevented. These were times of great satisfaction for me. We had some excellent secretaries of HHS and HHS, uh, three of them in particular, Joseph Califano, Patricia Harris, and Richard Swiker, were just uh, as supportive of public health as they could be. We had a fourth secretary, uh, Secretary Heckler, who did not have a great interest in health, but those first three really did help CDC. We had two excellent assistant secretaries for health, Julius Richmond during the Carter years and Ed Brandt during the Reagan years. The emergency response that CDC is so well known for has been absolutely essential to the development of this institution. First of all, it's provided better health for people who are uh, in the throes of an emergency. Number two, it's provided training and education for young people at CDC. But third, it's also improved what CDC has had to do in order to support that kind of, of an effort. So I think this is a tremendous uh, part of the CDC history. Global health 
will continue to be an important part of CDC because we are the gold standard for the world. And the Ebola outbreak and now the Zika outbreak continue to show that the CDC uh, effort is needed in order to provide for a healthy uh, world. The last thing I should say, I have regrets. One regret is I never could get injury control funded while I was director of CDC. We succeeded in doing that in later years, but when we would set up a budget for injury control, the response was always, this is a highway safety problem, this is a security problem, it's not a public health problem. We know it is, and finally it was funded. My other regret is how slow it was in uh, tobacco control. Tobacco control has certainly improved and smoking rates have gone down, but it's been far too slow. And finally, when I talk to people who worked during that era at CDC, there's such a great sense of satisfaction and they always talk about the coalitions and they talk about the humor that existed at CDC, CDC at that time. It was a wonderful job. Thank you. Congratulations are appropriate as CDC celebrates 70 years of distinguished achievement. I wish I could be there with you. From my vantage point, this amazing CDC shows no signs or symptoms of physical decline or dementia in spite of the advancing age. It seems only yesterday while I was serving as director it was a younger organization then, and we were struggling to upgrade and obtain essential laboratory and office space. We were involved in a fight to get essential funding for AIDS research and control activities. CDC had defined AIDS risk factors, and it was in the process of publishing science-based prevention guidelines such as universal precautions in MMWR. CDC had asked for authority to distribute an AIDS information brochure to help reduce HIV transmission and remove fear and discrimination. In 1987, this brochure was mailed to 104 million homes in the United States. We couldn't allow AIDS to distract us from other critical endeavors like control of vaccine-preventable diseases in inner cities where vaccine coverage lagged. The acquisition of the National Center for Health Statistics to partner with CDC's celebrated disease surveillance became another step in establishing CDC's chronic disease prevention and injury control responsibilities. It required great vision in, 18, in 1946 to reinvent an obscure organization called Malaria Control in War Areas to become the Communicable Disease Center. CDC's responsibilities and reputation grew through the ensuing years because of its staff, from the director's office to housekeeping. They focused on excellence. Amazing outcomes were produced by dedicated employees with all sorts of academic degrees and differing backgrounds who worked at every level in CDC. Enormous strength and innovation were created by this diversity. Visionary staff recognized that the length and quality of human life should be improved. They understood health is a global affair. Disease doesn't occur in one place without affecting the quality of life elsewhere. My mentor, Alex Langmuir, was an example of scientific excellence and visionary leadership. He earned academic recognition before arriving at CDC. Alex comprehended the threat of new and emerging infectious diseases and perceived the intent of future terrorists. Where would CDC be today without smallpox eradication? 
and Bill Fagey, Don Hopkins, D.A. Henderson, David Sensor, and the many others who were serving on a winning CDC WHO team. How well CDC faces the challenges and opportunities of the future decades will unquestionably depend on those who work there. Can CDC continue to attract and retain the best and brightest scientists? Will it thrive because of visionary leaders? The world needs visionary science-based leadership more today than ever before. Have a wonderful 70th anniversary celebration. I predict CDC will continue to be a light on the hill, a beacon directing the pursuit of public health excellence. My very best wishes for the future. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm delighted to join with you in this celebration of CDC's 70th anniversary. I wish I could be with you there in person, but nonetheless, we have a lot to celebrate together. During the time that I was there with help from lots of people, but especially Martha Katz, we focused intently on what CDC's mission is and came to describe it as the nation's prevention agency. I see now that you're talking about it as the nation's protection agency, and that's the logical follow-on. But it was during that period that Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa grew interested in changing the name of CDC formally to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we happily embraced that idea, but asked him as well to make sure the legislation specified that the initials would forever remain the CDC because of the brand equity that goes with that. Speaking of prevention, it was during my time there that with help from lots of people, especially Steve Thacker and Steve Teutsch and Jeff Copeland and others, that we created the Prevention Effectiveness Initiative that brought the tools of health economics and health services research to bear on the issues of prevention and how to advance the public's health through prevention. During my time as director, there was a case of what came to be known as healthcare worker transmission of HIV and AIDS. That caused a flurry of attention, appropriately so, and it taught me uh, deeply the importance of CDC's meticulous commitment to evidence-based generation of public health recommendations. That commitment is something that has stood CDC in good stead over these decades and will long into the future. As we look forward to what lies ahead, I just would further finally remember for you that in 1993, there was an outbreak of hantavirus in the southwestern United States. And the epidemic investigation and the infectious disease work and the public health preventive steps that were taken highlighted then the importance that persists even now for CDC to have a ready capability to put into action whenever called upon. We've learned that again last year with Ebola virus and this year again with Zika virus. So I think we need loudly to say to the public at large and to the Congress, it's important that CDC have that capability because the nation and the world depends on it. I'm proud of the things that you all have done, that we've done together through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it will do long into the future. Thank you very much. We're now honored to hear from Dr. David Satcher. Dr. Satcher served as CDC director from 1993 to 1998. He then went on to serve as U.S. Surgeon General for four years and Assistant Secretary of Health. Dr. Satcher uh, was there, uh, was here when the Vaccines for Children program was established, when PulseNet launched, when the fetal alcohol surveillance system was created, and really can provide a, a wonderful both historical background and guide for where we should be focusing our attention in the future. Dr. Satcher. Well, 
Thank you very much, Dr. Freeden, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here and to be able to share with you uh, this very special occasion. It brings back a lot of memories because during my tenure here, we celebrated CDC's 50th anniversary, and I'll say a little bit about that. But I think these celebrations are important because I think uh, leadership is important. Uh, at our Leadership Institute, we have two major principles that I think the CDC exemplifies. One, of course, is that leadership is a team sport, as you've heard. And secondly, that leadership is like a relay race. And as you hear the stories about how programs have been taken to a certain point and then handed off to future directors, again, I think the CDC illustrates uh, better than any place I can imagine that leadership is, in fact, a relay race. I want to start off by saying a word about this high idea of continuing momentum. Uh, when I came on board uh, in 1993, as you've heard, there was several important things to continue. And I, and I think the childhood vaccination program was certainly one of the most important. Uh, it was going well, except we were having trouble reaching certain underserved communities. For example, while the state of Vermont had an immunization rate of greater than 70% by the age of two, Detroit, Michigan had a rate of 29%. So we, we targeted uh, these cities by developing partnerships with the mayors of these cities, but we also developed partnership with the National Council of Black Churches, uh, with the Council of La Raza, with the WIC program, and I think these uh, partnerships made a great difference in our success at reaching children that we had had trouble reaching before. You might say that my whole excitement about disparities in health was sort of born during that period of time as we demonstrated that we could make a difference, that we could make a dent. You have to say a word about HIV AIDS, and I'll just say two things. One, I think it was during that early period that it was really gratifying to see the tremendous reduction uh, in, uh, in children uh, being infected with AIDS in utero. The fact that we were able to educate parents, test pregnant women, uh, treat them, and reduce the spread of HIV from mother to child. One of the greatest successes, in fact, uh, in the response to the AIDS epidemic. The other thing that we did here, uh, you heard the name Jim Curran before, and Jim did a lot of things here with HIV AIDS. Uh, Claire Broom, who's my deputy and I, decided to see if we could pull all of these different AIDS programs together. And so we, um, we pulled together a committee. They worked for several months and came up with a proposal. Uh, Helene Gill chaired that committee the proposal was that we bring the AIDS programs together in a new major institute at the CDC, the National Center for HIV, STD, and TB, was born around the mid-1990s, and Helene Gill was uh, appointed to direct that institute. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, there were 36 studies that CDC had funded throughout the country to evaluate um, the whole issue of needle and syringe exchange. There's a lot of political opposition to that, but the 36 studies showed that these exchanges could dramatically reduce the uh, spread of HIV AIDS and that they could do it without increasing drug use. In fact, many of the people came into treatment. So uh, we recommended that to Washington. Didn't go over too well. So, uh, but. It's one of the things about being Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health. As Assistant Secretary for Health, I had to agree with the administration. As Surgeon General, I didn't. <laughs> so, so I went around the country encouraging cities and states to fund needle and syringe exchange programs. That's just, um, of course, um, CDC has struggled with that in terms of the politics that often interfere with the success of public health. And uh, I think Bill Fagey mentioned the, um, the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. I think one of the most successful programs in the history of the CDC, 
uh, when we started, uh, there were 18 states that had developed these programs. We were able to, um, to spread them to all 50 states, and I would imagine in terms of the lives saved uh, throughout the country because of that program is, uh, is, is uh, innum uh, innumerable. Well, um, the second major thing that we had to do, and as a part of the leadership transition and uh, leadership as a relay race, was, a was to bring in new infrastructure strengthening programs. And I'll just mention them. Uh, the emerging infectious disease uh, obviously has been a real challenge. CDC has been a leader in terms of laboratory support throughout the world. And since you're so familiar with Ebola, I will mention, I will mention that in the mid-1990s, in Zaire, uh, the Congo, uh, there was a major outbreak of Ebola. Uh, about 30% of the people who died were physicians and nurses in this one hospital. Uh, CDC had a great team. Uh, they were sent to uh, Zaire, and within less than a month, of course, had control of that outbreak. Uh, of course, uh, they were very good, but the difference with West Africa, of course, was that in Zaire, there was a river that prevented the ease of movement, and unlike in West Africa, where people could easily cross borders. Uh, you've heard uh, about injury and violence prevention, and that is such an important program that I have to say um, that I think is one of the most important things that CDC has done. It has not been easy, and it's not easy today. Uh, we, did, we funded eight centers of excellence for injury prevention and control. Um, however, politically, we again, we ran into problems because one of, um, one of our grantees really did a study showing that, in fact, uh, homes with guns were not safer than homes without guns. It was a very well done study, Art Kellerman and others. And of course, uh, with that, Congress decided to take the money out of the budget. And unfortunately, to this day, it uh, hasn't been returned. But I think we're getting close. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, I'll mention a few things that we tried to add to the infrastructure. I think the behavioral, the Associate Director for Behavioral Health, Marjorie Spears, was a very important development. Mrs. Carter mentioned that last year at her symposium. I think mental health is, health is important. I would be able to go on and, and release the first Surgeon General's report on mental health, but it started here at the CDC and our Associate Director for Mental Health. We also um, were able to build on the work of, of uh, Bill Roper and others. Congress had passed legislation in 92 allowing for the development of a CDC foundation. Uh, we were able to appoint a board, outstanding board of directors for that foundation, and to recruit an outstanding leader in Charlie Stokes. Uh, in the first 10 years of that foundation, it raised over $100 million, because there are times now when it raises $100 million a year. But it got off to a great start. It was a very important part of the infrastructure, and still is. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services had had a program in, a, a in prevention, in the, the guide to clinical prevention, and we felt that it was important to go beyond that. So we started the Guide to Community Prevention. And uh, some of the leaders of that program are still here, but it turned out to be very important. And people all over the country have benefited from that Guide to uh, Community Prevention. I mentioned the Tuskegee study. And it might, you may say, well, how does that relate to the infrastructure? I think trust is a very important part of the public health infrastructure. And I think what the Tuskegee study had done, and maybe continues to do, is to interrupt that trust. There were people in the country who didn't trust public health because they knew about the role of public health in uh, studying these 400 black men in Tuskegee without treating them, even after penicillin became available. Um, the uh, Tuskegee study was transferred to the CDC in 1959, and in 1972 it was discontinued. Uh, we felt that it was really important to revisit the Tuskegee study, so an outstanding commission of 100 persons uh, were put together, and they came up with a report really revisiting what happened with Tuskegee, uh, and we presented that report to President Clinton and Secretary Shalala, 
uh, with a recommendation for a national apology, which President Clinton released on May 17, 1996. Uh, it was important. It was not just an apology. It said three things. One, it said that anybody who received federal funding would have to demonstrate on an ongoing basis a knowledge of the legal and ethical aspect of research, doing research in human population. That communities, uh, just like we have informed consent for individuals, there had to be community informed consent. And he recommended that there be a bioethics center at Tuskegee. And that bioethics center is going strong on the leadership of Reuben Warren, who I guess was director of the Office of Minority Health here at the CDC at the time. Well, let me close by saying that CDC is a, is a great uh, institution. Um, there are always new and emergent, emerging challenges. Uh, the one that started uh, in a big way while I was here, of course, was the overweight and obesity, the rapid rise in Americans who were overweight and obese. And out of that, of course, uh, came a very interesting uh, program. For, those, for that 50th anniversary, our project here, the Director's Challenge, was to get the CDC employees to become physically active and to engage in good nutrition. And I must say, uh, the dramatic increase was impressive. Um, it went from about 30% to about 70% in that one year. But the CDC uh, population was quite engaged, led us to get the Surgeon General to do a Surgeon General's report on physical activity and nutrition. And later on, of course, as Surgeon General, I released the Surgeon General's call to action to prevent and reduce overweight and obesity. I'll say again, um, I strongly believe that leadership is a team sport, and I believe that, um, that leadership is like a relay race, and the challenge of passing the baton has been met quite well in the history of this organization. So congratulations on this 70th birthday of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you very much, Dr. Satcher. And speaking of passing the baton, we now move on to Dr. Jeff Copeland, 1998 to 2002, momentous years, uh, World Trade Center attacks, anthrax attacks, the National Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disability established as part of CDC. So an expanding uh, mission, an expanding mandate, and an increasingly complicated world to navigate. Jeff? Thanks, Tom. While CDC directors are political appointees, we have all been driven by respect for the institution and its mission. Thus, we serve in a continuum, as David said, building on our predecessors and contributing to our successors. Similarly, any individual's director's achievements inevitably involve from several colleagues to hundreds of colleagues. Whether obvious or not, it's always a team effort. We've got a, a horizontal common mission and a vertical hand down mission. In 1998, in the few weeks before and after uh, I officially became director here, the future priorities in many ways was shaped by three conversations. One, a lunch conversation weeks before I started I had lunch conversations with the center directors, many, many of whom are lined up here uh, today, but it was a different cast then. And I had a lunch conversation with Jim Hughes, who I'm glad to see here, about what were the important things in infectious diseases. And the takeaway from that lunch, which left me uneasy forever, was um, <laughs> we needed to focus on bioterrorism because it was uh, not if it was going to occur, but when it was going to occur. A second conversation involved a phone meeting, briefing, with senior leadership at WHO. And there seemed to be a, a, a slackening of commitments to polio eradication. Through further phone calls and a visit to Geneva, we were able to get a reaffirmation of polio eradication as a vital global good and absolutely necessary public health priority. 
A third conversation took place in an antecedent auditorium to this. Those of you may remember auditorium, the very appropriately and well-named auditoriums A and B. <laughs> um, and we met in a windowless room beneath those auditoriums to discuss a problem. Should we continue duct tape and super glue repairs or make a case for a complete coordinated multi-campus building plan? Uh, it was a difficult decision to make. We needed auditoria, uh, but these were, would require millions of dollars of investment to be torn to be remodeled. And um, in that discussion, I distinctly remember suggesting that we knock down the auditoria, that we didn't have funds to put up anything new, so we would have a field there, and that we conduct whatever meetings people wanted to have in that field <laughs> with megaphones. The protest was made that it would be winter and people would be cold, and the answer was <laughs> they can wear coats to the meetings that are. But we thought that would draw attention to what was an untenable cycle of repairing places that were well beyond repair. The goal, however, was not to build buildings and to create a, um, a, a, a landscape. It was to strengthen science at CDC as we entered the 21st century. We needed to recruit and retain the best scientists, whether they were laboratory scientists, epidemiologists, social and behavioral, environmental, chronic, infectious, etc., to do the first-rate work that was needed. And to do that first-rate work, we needed first-rate facilities. The facilities we had at the time were subpar to many of the better high schools in the Atlanta area. Uh, and yet we were never able to get traction on getting the funds needed uh, to put that into place. And that, that's, this um, need for facilities was true both in Atlanta at its multiple campuses. At the time we had over 12 separate campus spaces are scattered around the city, but it was true of our facilities in Hyattsville, Morgantown, Pittsburgh, Fort Collins, etc. All needed help, and again, the purpose was to get the best people able to do the best work. I think throughout CD's history, CDC's history, when people are asked, why do you work here and not at a university? I feel like you could ask the reverse question to me now. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> And the answer has always been mission. And without further explanation, we all know what that means. It's the particular calling we have to be here. And to do that mission, anything that interferes with us doing that mission is a hindrance and undermines our efforts. And so that was the spirit in which the Buildings and Facilities Plan took place. We sought and achieved an aesthetically pleasing, energy efficient approach on multiple sites in Atlanta and our other locations. And rather than just a cluster of nondescript buildings, we sought a campus whose design and quality would reflect the high quality of the workers and indeed inspire those workers to high quality work and their tasks. I drew up a crude plan in that meeting in that sub-basement um, room with um, Sam Tarr and George Chandler, and George still has it in a uh, this a uh, flip chart page in his uh, locker at wherever site he's at now. They're both still at CDC. And that is a picture of a row of administrative buildings, uh, a water feature in the center, a campus, a trail around the whole campus so people could get some exercise, and new labs lining the whole other side. It looks remarkably similar to what's outside now. <laughs> In order to get that done, we assembled a great team with Ginny Harris leading a group that addressed budget, architect, and construction company selection, while Martha Katz worked with the CDC Foundation to put together the Friends of CDC, who played a key role in Washington in gaining funding. And Phil Jacobs, uh, Bernie Marcus, and Oz Nelson played a key role in that. We couldn't have done it. You, could, you can't do it with state health department directors. You can't do it with public health people. But business people who were contributors to the major parties could play a key role in threatening legislators to do what they should have done in the first place. <laughs> a second achievement was to initiate an accelerated engagement by CDC and global health, as exemplified by 
a rededicated commitment to polio eradication, the initiation of the stop teams to which to, 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 to today are still active and effective, by retaining a positive and mutually respective CDC relationship with WHO, and developing a global HIV AIDS presence, first through the global AIDS program, GAP, and then followed by PEPFARS, and by working closely with China to establish the China CDC and a national surveillance and public health network for the world's largest, most populous country. Third, we prepared for pandemics and bioterror, but also for risk factors that posed major contributions to the US burden of illness. We increased the stockpile of a new smallpox vaccine. We established a laboratory specimens triage unit. We strengthened active serology and pathology units and provided states with training and agents, such as anthrax, that could be used for terrorist acts. We identified the obesity epidemic, and an article in JAMA by CDC authorship received the most press attention in JAMA history. We later linked that increase to obe in obesity to a marked increase in diabetes and other chronic diseases. Fourth, we sought to strengthen capacities of state health departments and fought for and gained a $1 billion increased appropriation from Congress for state laboratories and health departments. Fifth, we designated the 10th greatest public health achievements of the 20th century and used this to publicize the value of public health to the general population and to government decision makers. CDC is special. The most important thing we tried to do was retain the unique aspects that make CDC such a respected and honored agency. We resisted the notion that CDC needs to be more like the NIH or DHHS or the DOD. It didn't then and it doesn't now. It's a special place because we are driven by our mission, share core values, and are committed to addressing the needs of the poor, the underserved, and those at increased risk, both in the US and around the world. CDC has a unique culture where leaders are surrounded by the best people and listen to them. Everyone, regardless of rank, is treated with respect. Service is embraced as a calling. And we strive to be humble about what we know and don't know, and most of all, if you work at CDC, you get to be part of a talented, interesting group of people who genuinely like each other and enjoy what they do every day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. We're sitting here now because of that relay race that's uh, allowed the establishment of these wonderful facilities that match the world-class excellence of our staff with world-class facilities uh, in, in uh, Atlanta and around the, the, uh, the country. Uh, Dr. Julie Gerberding was director from 2002 to 2008. Um, again, momentous years, SARS response, rubella eliminated in the U.S., Hurricane Katrina and the response. Uh, and so very much looking forward to hearing from Julie. It's an incredible honor to be here and a little awesome to see this auditorium so full of people and I know there are people in rooms next door and, and hopefully on the web, but what could be more fitting for bringing us together than the celebration of 70 years of absolute extraordinary achievement in public health. Um, we really do and congratulate you and hope that we do have at least 70 more years to celebrate going forward. I've been listening to my predecessors, and it's very humbling to think about the history that brought us to where we are today, but also the challenges that are ahead of us. And when I thought about what I would like to contribute, I thought I would start with uh, a reflection on the fact that during my tenure, I, um, I was really operating in the first 10 years of this millennium when we were dealing with the flat world that flat world of incredible digital connectivity, financial connectivity, and social connectivity 
as uh, was described in a book by Tom Frieden, Friedman, not Frieden, um, a, few, a, a few years ago. And I think we've always been recognized globally as leaders in public health and incredibly important organizations. But that's not always been appreciated inside the United States or in our government. And some of the things that we've already talked about in terms of HIV and the other challenges that we've experienced in, in this millennium have, I think, taught Americans and America political leaders how important it is to have a globally capable and competent public health agency in our midst. The first um, real example of that, of course, was um, the HIV AIDS epidemic and the appreciation that this just wasn't some ordinary epidemic that 40 million people at, at the early days of this millennium were likely to be infected and living with HIV AIDS and 20 million people were dying. That is a public health emergency. And it was a slowly burning emergency in the minds of many people, but when people finally stood back and looked at it, realized that this was a pandemic and it needed global leadership and a great deal more action than we'd been able to muster up to that point. So the Global AIDS Program, PEPFAR, was announced in the President's State of the Union Address in 2003, and then the Congress did appropriate a budget of $15 billion over a five-year period of time, which was at least commensurate with the scale and scope of the problem we were trying to resolve. Um, CDC was a main implementer, but of course PEPFAR involved many partners, many federal agencies, and many, many, many thousands of people in the affected countries. But I think there were some aspects of the PEPFAR implementation that were uniquely uh, valued and uniquely due to CDC. First and foremost was the fact that our work in PEPFAR is based on science, that we really exemplified the importance of surveillance, of really understanding the determinants of transmission, the scale and shape and scope of the epidemic as it moved through communities, the value of interventions, the changes in virology, uh, the epidemiology of the uh, opportunistic infections, and so on and so on, that our PEPFAR implementation programs were founded on that scientific framework that really, I think, was the distinguishing factor that built on the Global AIDS program, but also kept us in the game as PEPFAR was administered by the administration in a more consolidated format. The second thing I think that was unique about CDC's contribution was the fact that we built local capacity. Uh, we don't do PEPFAR through large implementing organ organizations by and large. We work with local individuals, training them, helping build the people's capacity who will stay and work in their communities and in their in, in their laboratories and in their clinics so that when we leave, the capacity remains and we create an impact that exceeds the immediate short-term value of the dollars that we contribute. The last thing I would say that I think is uniquely a CDC characteristic in this regard is something that if you don't have a chance to go and visit a PEPFAR site, you might not fully appreciate, but it's how highly respected the CDC teams are by the health ministries and the local government. That we're not in the embassies when we can avoid it. Um, the CDC has been embedded in the health ministries or in the clinical arena where they're working side by side with the local health officials rolling up their sleeves on the front line and really contributing what is the best of CDC with incredible innovation, energy, and passion for what they're doing. Um, these are some of the most recent results of the PEPFAR program that, was, uh, that were outlined in this year's report to Congress. Um, and I, I think this is an extraordinary, extraordinary public health achievement that I truly believe would not have been achieved to this magnitude without the efforts of an incredibly um, large, dynamic, and amazing workforce of CDC. Now, when I uh, came into the role, we had what well, we were still dealing with the aftermath of the anthrax attacks, but it didn't take me very long to realize that um, Mother Nature was a much better terrorist than the people that we were focusing on at the time. 
Um, the very first experience, of course, was SARS, uh, a, an epidemic that really characterized um, how fast things can move around the world in this very small world. Literally overnight, 11 travelers globalized this new infectious disease. So that was a very sobering uh, reality and, and, and one that I think um, caused everyone to recognize the global nature of the threats that we face. That was followed in not very long time by the flu vaccine shortage when one of the two suppliers was not able to supply vaccine in a given year. That really illustrated the vulnerability of our influenza vaccine uh, system, which is not a whole lot better today. I know now from my vantage point in the industry and uh, the, the need for global action to secure a much more robust and accessible supply of vaccine. The next year we experienced a year of influenza on a seasonal basis, but one that had an especially challenging outcome for young children, a disproportionate mortality in children in at least some parts of the country, uh, illustrating that even seasonal influenza can be full of surprises. And then, of course, there was avian influenza, um, a disease that was fortunately not very transmissible, but had a very high mortality rate. And when you look at these things in sequence, it doesn't take a great imagination to appreciate that you know, Mother Nature is playing with us, something that moves fast, something that's highly transmissible, something that disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, or something that um, really uh, defies our ability to use our manufacturing and science to mitigate against. And finally, after all of these things happened, some people in Washington woke up again and realized that we really did need to take pandemic planning seriously. Um, you, CDC published a great review of pandemic planning since 1976, and it was sort of a waxing and waning investment, but no sustained um, congressional support, no sustained administration support for a true pandemic preparedness platform. And finally, that platform uh, was created, the funding did follow, and once again, CDC, while it was a whole of government effort, the CDC was the central um, dynamic that really created the scientific credibility and the platform for preparedness. Um, this is a great time also to recognize that while we're celebrating 70 years of CDC, we wouldn't be celebrating if it weren't for our partners in the state and local health departments. And this is just one example where they too really stepped up to the plate and made extraordinary contributions to um, what we needed to do to build local capacity. The flu summits that were held in every state wouldn't have happened without uh, the leadership of our state and local partners, as well as the partners in our healthcare system. So that network, that connectivity, or I guess the flat world of public health really paid off. But in the center of this slide are just some pictures reminding me of the incredible importance of the science in our labs. Uh, Nancy Cox who worked tirelessly to characterize viruses and her teams of people were literally going around the world to make sure that we understood the epidemiology and the virology of what was happening and that we helped prepare other countries to be able to do that. Our immunology branch with uh, innovations in surveillance, um, all of the um, stockpiling and preparation for uh, countermeasure delivery and so on and so forth in, in a, in, in a, a a concerted way, the pandemic preparedness effort brought all of the parts of our agency together that really play a role in these kinds of infectious disease emergencies. And I, I, I hope that that lesson, um, which still does not seem to result in, in continuous funding, will ultimately be learned by our bill payers that we must have sustained funding for our infectious disease preparedness efforts because um, we are just always one traveler away from an outbreak or one animal exposure away, and I'm sure Tom will talk a little bit about um, Zika in a minute. The last thing I wanted to say was that we have done so many things in so many ways, and, and yet um, there are some things, at least for me personally, I regret I didn't put more focus and attention on them, and two of them are illustrated in these photographs. Um, those are really the very linked problems of women and water. 
um, women because they really do hold up more than half the earth, and yet everywhere in the world there are still tremendous gender disparities in health and in all other humanitarian aspects. The women on the right are at a hospital in Kabul, and the woman, uh, I, I guess uh, this woman is the woman who is um, retrieving water from the headwaters of the Nile River, and there's a cow standing about 20 feet away from her while she's doing this. Um, and it also um, really tells me that it takes a CDC. It takes a CDC to recognize these kinds of cross-cutting challenges. It, it takes a National Center of Environmental Health, but it also takes a National Center of Infectious Disease, of birth defects, of injury. Um, all of the different components of the CDC on a global basis have plenty of work cut out for them going forward. I have no doubt that we will succeed in making global contributions in these areas as well. And I, I look forward to being the, the loudest champion that I can be in any place that I can be to advocate for what is necessary to help the CDC get the resources and the recognition that it deserves. Um, David Satcher got to say what his um, leadership philosophy was, and I <clears throat> take this advantage to say what my leadership philosophy is, and that is it's an incredible privilege, and I thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you. Well, it's a good thing that we are a, uh, uh, in a literal uh, and not a actual relay race because we're running about 25 minutes late. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to just show six or seven slides from uh, the past seven years, seven and a half years at CDC to give a sense of what some of the current uh, actions have been and the current progress building on the work before. You heard from Dr. Gerberding the wonderful work done in influenza, uh, probably the biggest risk that we face. If we can have the first slide, please. Uh, it's so important to look back at what we've accomplished, but also look forward at what we can accomplish in the future. Um, it's a, it is, as you've heard, a remarkable privilege to serve as CDC director, and something that uh, I think all of us uh, treasure. Um, I want to just very quickly note that we've had uh, much progress keeping the United States safer and stronger, the lowest smoking rate in history. Uh, we've also seen healthcare-associated infections, at least of some kinds, fall substantially. We've also seen a steady decrease in teen pregnancy, also to the lowest rate in U.S. history, something that we've focused on through partners. Uh, nutrition, physical activity, obesity, we certainly haven't succeeded but we've begun to see decreases in obesity in some populations in some parts of the country, younger children, and some food safety uh, progress for some pathogens and some products. We've also seen a uh, dramatic drop in motor vehicle fatalities, although the past year shows not such a positive trend, but we have seen a, a big decrease, building on that injury work, always challenging. And in HIV, fewer and fewer people are unaware of their infection. That helps them so that they can get care, and that helps the society so they're less likely to spread. Globally, the relay race of polio eradication has continued, and the world is closer than ever. We've gone from more than 350,000 polio cases a year to 74 last year and uh, less than two dozen so far this year. Uh, we also have seen uh, the challenge of dealing with Ebola, and I'll talk more about that in a, mom in a moment, but we were able to surge in with the rest of the world to stop the world's first true epidemic of Ebola. We've also responded to emergencies, as in Haiti. You don't often hear the words Haiti and progress in the same sentence, but actually we are on the verge of elimination of malaria, filariasis, and maternal to child transmission of HIV in Haiti, so lots of progress there. We've also seen substantial progress with global health security, and this really, we think, is the next big thing in global health. As Dr. Fagy says, we need to tie the fears of the rich to the needs of the poor. Global health security does that by emphasizing that unless every country is able to find, stop, and prevent a health threat when and where it emerges, their country, the region, the world, and the United States will be at greater risk. We also have seen substantial progress uh, with PEPFAR, and Dr. Gerberding talked about this. This is the largest bilateral global health program ever, and we've continued that uh, important relay race. The numbers you saw, they're 
really transformational uh, throughout many parts of the world. And something you don't hear about is the widespread transmission of MERS, and that's because we were able to work with partners to rapidly identify it and stop the spread uh, around the world and in the U.S. Here at CDC, we focused on being stronger and more effective, identifying areas where we can make very specific progress, enhancing our scientific rigor, including and especially our laboratories, which are truly the secret of our success at CDC, looking at future leadership, not only through the EIS program, which celebrated its 60th anniversary recently, but also through the laboratory leadership service, analogous to the EIS program, thought of a few years ago, but finally we've gotten over the finish line to start it, and thanks so much for the staff who have done that. I think in future years we'll look back at the LLS as having a similar transformational impact on laboratory science and safety that EIS has had on epidemiology. Uh, and our public health associate program, crucially important, literally rejuvenating public health. We now have hundreds of new dynamic public health leaders with uh, on the ground experience on the front lines entering public health and year after year they will infuse a new sense of enthusiasm and accomplishment into our work. In communications we've honed the MMWR as our main vehicle of communication, but also moved into social media where CDC now has the most visited health website in the world. Uh, we collaborate with healthcare, understanding that the Affordable Care Act brings remarkable opportunities but also real challenges. And the work of en ensuring that we have quality healthcare delivered effectively to achieve public health gains is crucially important for us. And emergency operations. The Emergency Operations Center has been activated for more than 90% of the time of the past seven years. And that's a reflection of the world that we live in. Um, Ebola is important to reflect on. It was, we believe, the longest, most sustained, uh, most extensive response in CDC history. We had more than 4,000 staff involved, more than 1,300 people deployed to West Africa. You see on the slide here what could have happened, uh, exponential increase, uh, what, what was projected to happen if we reached the tipping point of adequate care and adequate uh, safe burial, we would then see a rapid decline. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw in both Liberia and Sierra Leone. At the bottom, you see uh, that in, in that little uh, noticed uh, line at the very bottom of the top left, you see what would have happened with rapid uh, control. In fact, that range is exactly what actually did happen. So CDC's model both guided what happened and predicted what did happen. Uh, Nigeria could have been an absolute disaster uh, if CDC staff, along with CDC's trained staff in polio eradication, had not stopped Ebola in Lagos. There is every likelihood that it would have spread for months or years throughout Nigeria and Africa, and we would still be dealing with a global catastrophe. Uh, in March of 2014, uh, Ebola spread in West Africa. There was a limited response, tens of thousands of cases, at least 11,000 deaths from Ebola, a larger number from other causes. In March of 2016, another outbreak, rapid response by host government, 13 cases, nine deaths, outbreak stopped. That's the world that we need to work toward. We're now dealing with Zika, an unprecedented threat, first time ever. We've had a mosquito-borne cause of birth defects. Uh, CDC staff are undertaking remarkable work, not only with program implementation, but with innovations, new ways to control mosquitoes, new ways to test for the virus, new uses of virus-like particles to create uh, 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 testing kits, and new ways to control mosquitoes with natural pro products that are effective and low toxicity. All of these things will take time, but they remind me of a critical point that Dr. Fagy makes. All of us in public health should be involved not just in program implementation, but in the rigorous evaluation of programs. And I think that's one of the great strengths of CDC, that we've continuously been not only willing, but eager to ask the question, so what? Why are these programs important and how can they be better? What are we doing to advance the impact that we're having in communities and the science that we have in our laboratories, on our computers, and with our partners. So thank you all very much for the work that you do in advancing public health.
no children in life for that to be born because that won't happen for a few months. And the actions that were recommended uh, are concerning. Uh, aerial spraying to try to knock down the number of mosquitoes. This builds on the problem of lack of trust. The government is actually the use of it. It builds on the need for emergency response for uh, Dr. Koch, Dr. Kirby spoke of. Any advice on how we can advance public health progress? <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would say is, number one, you're facing a tremendous challenge, and I congratulate you for how you met it today. The answer is in Puerto Rico, though. It's not, it's not here. So I think it, the issue of culture and values are really critical things in terms of getting the cooperation of a population. They look, may look at uh, microencephaly not as we look at it when they compare it with all of the other things they're struggling with. So I think um, somehow we've got to connect with the culture. That's easier said than done, so that's why I said it. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think... You know. Jeff? Just building on David's point, when, um, when I was an EIS officer in my first two years at CDC, there was one behavioral scientist in all of CDC. His name was Bill Darrow. Uh, and today, hundreds. Uh, and it's an integral part of the complex public health problems we deal with, whether it's tobacco or obesity or any of the infectious diseases. So to David's point, uh, early on getting a community assessment, what drives people, what do they care about, what would be an important message. And I know there's an emergency situation, but maybe there's an emergency analog to epidemiologists rushing to the fray and it's to get a quick and dirty, if you will, a community assessment as to what some of these uh, answers are locally that will then make them either more amenable to the interventions we propose or the opposite and, and that cause us to take alternative approaches. Thank you, and in fact, that was absolutely crucial in Ebola where we had anthropologists and sociologists looking at the situations. The second uh, question I would ask is the, what I refer to as the, the question of lane. When I got to CDC, people told me, you know, that's not our lane. And to me, this is one of the, the great challenges of CDC because public health over the decades expands and contracts. It expands as we add birth defects or chronic disease or injury to our mission. It contracts as other parts of government spin off and create, whether it's 100 years ago, departments of sanitation or environmental protection, but whether it's vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, state and local health departments or other parts of the federal government or HHS, how would you try to define our lane? I like to say public health doesn't have a lane, we have a superhighway. But uh, this is clearly an area where we can get into political challenges, where there can be turf battles, but ultimately we try to do whatever we can to protect people and to advance health. And h how would you think of that question of what's the appropriate role or lane of CDC? I fear that the metaphor you're using will promote someone to say that's individual responsibility to keep your car in the center of the lane, whether it's auto drive or not. I think the lane for public health is um, what kills, injures, and disables people, and how we can both classify it, learn from it, and do something to stop it. And when we started chronic disease activities at CDC in the um, late 70s, early 80s, and then through the 80s, innumerable leaders in this institution said, we don't do that. We shouldn't have a cancer program. We shouldn't worry about heart disease. That's for NIH to do. And um, others of us felt that was, a leap, was, we would be a museum for our 70th uh, anniversary <laughs> rather than uh, an active public health agency. Julie? I, I obviously agree with what Jeff said, that the, the notion of a lane just seems so anachronistic. Um, and even a superhighway is a little slow these days. So, you know, we're really a network and, you know, we're, we're hubs and spokes of, of incredible technical and, and traditional knowledges 
that it, it, it's wherever there's a problem, we are likely to have something to contribute. That doesn't mean we always have to be the leader, but I'm sure we can um, wade into almost any lane where there's a health issue that requires strong surveillance, strong epidemiology, and strong assessment of risk and risk mitigation. So um, we're everywhere. Thank you. Yo, know, just briefly, I, Jeff and I were talking earlier about the definition of public health that I believe was included in the 1988 IOM report, but basically said public health is the collective efforts of a society to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. Now, I served on WHO's Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and we released that report as a big new thing. But when you look back at the definition of 1988, it actually included all the conditions that can interfere with people being healthy. And I think that's our lane. Great. I think we're going to go to Twitter for our first question, then we'll come to questions in the room. Much of America is still plagued by unhealthy habits, such as tobacco use, lack of physical activity, and poor diet that lead to chronic diseases and a diminished quality of life. What approaches will reduce the burden of chronic disease? Ways to address chronic disease. I think tobacco has taught us so much in uh, that 50-year report from the Surgeon General. So I think we've learned a lot. You know, for example, we were talking earlier when California was, became the first state to pass legislation uh, restricting smoking in public places. The response to that was not only legal and how do I stay out of jail, but cultural. It's, it was no longer cool to smoke. You know, it was uh, had to do with values and culture. And I, I just think that that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind. We can learn a lot from what we've experienced with tobacco. It's amazing. Just on, on the same note, that in the early 70s, if you were to describe a, a major de decrease in smoking prevalence rates, um, the turning around of American culture from a smoking culture to a non-smoking culture, uh, people would have scoffed at, at that notion that this could happen. So when someone says to you that we can't do something in public health, you can't change human behavior is what we hear often re related to risk factors for non-communicable diseases and uh, chronic diseases. That's garbage. Uh, we've done it innumerable times. When I grew up driving, we didn't use seat belts. We, there were not airbags required in every car. Um, we've changed our behaviors in multiple ways for a positive health effect, and tobacco is one of them. We'll have to do the same in terms of diet and physical activity, in terms of dealing with many of the chronic diseases, and with obesity and hypertension, et cetera. It can be done. And it, the same thing needs to be done for gun control. I just add to that the concept of health in all policies. Uh, because in a sense, that's what's happened with the tobacco success story that we've created, a set of policies that come in many dimensions in many different locations and took a long time, um, but ultimately they resulted in the kind of sociologic change that we're experiencing today. And I, I think the, the ability to nudge people into better behavior, to create the right kind of behavioral economic incentives, whether that's through um, costs or rewards, there are lots of tools that can influence what people eat and how physically active they are and add into that our digital era and all of the devices and nudging that we can achieve. I just came from hiking in the Dolomites and I can tell you exactly how many steps and how many stories I hiked every day. And I would just add that there are real lessons to be learned from the infectious disease world. Surveillance, policy change, interaction with clinical providers, specific programs, working in different areas and documenting the evidence of impact there, developing practice-based evidence from, for programs that work. All of these are things that we've honed in our infectious disease work, and they're all quite applicable to uh, any health problem we face. First question in the room, succinctly, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Kamara Jones. I'm the president of the American Public Health Association and proudly a former CDC scientist. Um, at APHA, we are launching a national campaign against racism. And especially given the events of last week, which brought to the fore again 
the profound impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation. I would like each of your perspectives on CDC's kind of legitimate leadership role or not in naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on health, especially given the history of CDC that we've laid out, which has been one of embracing more and more issues as being within the legitimate domain of public health intervention. Yeah, first, let me commend you, Kamara, for your leadership in this area. I especially like the fact that you have put racism in a really clear perspective. It's not a situation where you point fingers at other people, but you say, this is a problem of society. We're all victims. Now, together, we all have to solve it. I think that's why you've made such great progress. I know we have a lot more progress to make. But I hope that we can all get on board with the fact that racism is a problem of our society. We should acknowledge it and we should work together because we're all victims of it. And, and it's a, a crucial element of public health. Uh, exactly. And it affects um, a wide range of health conditions and risk factors across the board. So as a, you know, we've all agreed that social determinants are criti critically important, and racism is, a, is one of these social determinants. I just also would add that racism is a global issue. I think sometimes we think of it as a U.S. issue, but it's actually functional in just about any society I can think of, and we have to think about it broadly as a health issue and a social, and a social issue. Uh, race is, in many ways, the original sin of the United States. And we have a great deal to do to continue to address the disparities and inequalities in health outcomes in our society. And I think one of our roles at CDC is to bear witness to those inequalities, but another is to identify very specific ways in which we can confront them. We'll go to our Twitter feed for the next question. If future CDC directors are watching or listening right now, what sort of skills do you think the next CDC director should have to address some of the threats that could impact the way we work and the work we do? The question was what other skills would a future director have to have? I'll say first, a thick skin. <laughs> and, and accompany that with a sense of humor. <laughs> well, this is easy to say, but leadership. I think the leadership skills are probably most important. The CDC has a lot of very, very talented people, very committed people, but we still look to leadership to bring together the team approach and to make sure that we're communicating appropriately and things like that. And I don't have anything to add. I think the thick skin really hits home with me. Um, but it, it is also really important, I think, to um, to come to the role with humility and to recognize that it is a team sport, but it's also a network of people across far more than just the CDC or the public health community that have to be brought to be together to get anything done. So that ability to, um, to collaborate and to build a big tent of people with different points of view and different perspectives. Just a, an added comment. The, probably anyone who's out there thinking, that's why I, I want to be the CDC director, is probably not going to happen. Uh, it's, it's, it's the person sitting out there that says, it's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm really happy in one of the lab I'm working in or the project I'm working on. You better worry about what it's going to Well, we're, we've gone over. What I'd like to do is ask, uh, starting with Dr. Satcher for each of us to say a couple of last words before we break for our reception and hear from Judy Monroe. Uh, but we have gone over in time, so we don't have time for more questions. But any last thoughts, Dr. Satcher? Well, um, this actually comes from the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And it's sort of a guiding principle, which uh, is much bigger than, of course, than I am. But it says that uh, in order to achieve health equity, uh, we need leaders who first care enough. But we also need leaders who know enough, leaders who have the courage to do enough, and leaders who will persevere until the job is done. And the CDC has been blessed with a lot of leaders throughout the agency who fit that picture. That's a good way to wrap it up.
Thank you. Well, uh, we've collectively agreed that we can't improve on that statement. Uh, what truly makes CDC great, and CDC is great, is the people here at CDC. Uh, you combine the three critical factors that are needed. Scientific rigor, and I like to say that if you opened a textbook of medicine to any page randomly, you'd probably find one of, if not the world's expert in that disease or condition here at CDC. So a scientific expert along with operational excellence, the ability to get the job done, whether it's the public health advisor series or contracting or grants or operational activities, that's crucially important. Good ideas don't get anywhere unless you can implement them. But third, and what you've heard about, uh, perhaps more frankly from others than I'm at liberty to say now, is the importance of politics and of political commitment to doing what works to save lives. And that key triad of uh, science, operational, and politics uh, is what allows CDC to protect Americans and protect people around the world. Uh, of course, to get to the right political decision means getting the right information to the right people in the right form at the right time so the right decision can be made. And that all can be done with the science and the operational aspects within limits. Uh, but we also recognize that it is a long-term battle, that it's not something that we can change overnight. And a 70-year retrospective helps us remember how far we've come recognize how far we still have to go, but gives us the confidence to know that we can take that baton, we can have that relay race, and continue to accelerate as we improve health, reduce health disparities, and protect lives not only in this country, but around the world. So thank you all so very much. Now, I think we're going to hear from Judy Monroe. Judy is the uh, new president and CEO of the CDC Foundation. She's done a tremendous amount in the first few months. Uh, great uh, leadership, uh, great help on Ebola. Uh, so thanks for your support. And she's going to also tell us about our, our reception right outside. So. Thanks, Tom. Um, just very briefly, uh, wow, I think all of you would join me in saying incredible stories, uh, incredible 70 years, uh, and so much more uh, yet to do. But. Um, in addition to all that you've heard this morning, I would also just remind everyone, I know from my own experience, that every single day there are clinicians, individuals, public health officials, communities, just across the world that are looking to your guidance, using those guidelines, and, and looking to your expertise. Um, and of course, CDC would not be the great organization it is without the great leaders, uh, as you've seen today. So uh, what a wonderful morning to be able to have the caliber of leaders such as Drs. Fagey, Mason, Roper, Satcher, Copeland, uh, Gerberding, and Frieden uh, with us today. A very, very special uh, morning. But I want to reiterate something I heard from several of, of the directors is that it's all of you. It takes a great team. So great leaders have to be supported by great teams. And I will say when I was at CDC, and I continue to see this, the part, it's not just your scientific expertise, but it's that willingness to put yourself in harm's way and, and, and personal sacrifice that makes CDC such a remarkable uh, organization. So on behalf of the CDC uh, Foundation's board of directors and staff, we just want to really congratulate you on 70 years. We look forward to continuing uh, to support you from the foundation. And uh, with that, there is a reception. So thank you. Thank you.